Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Yu Fang and I'm a developer advocate for Google Cloud. And so today I want to talk to you guys about how to get machine learning onto your physical devices when there's no network connectivity and convince you why you would want to do that, why you would actually prefer, even with network connectivity, to leave it aside, perhaps, in certain situations. But to get there, I want to start back. We're going to go back in time, back to when the computer first came about. Right? That started this computing revolution that we're in today. But today, we're in what we call an AI-first world. How did we get here? Well, first we had the computer, and that gave us computing. Then the internet came, right? The internet connected all the computers together. And I want to point out that the internet did not wipe out the computer, right? The computer is still in use today. Then came mobile. The mobile revolution brought the internet to everyone. It brought the connected computers into our pockets. And again, we see that mobile did not wipe out the internet. We still use the internet. It's still strong. We're on IP version 6. We're running out of IP addresses. And so too will AI not replace mobile, but build on top of it. And so I see mobile as a key foundation for the core of how we will interact with AI in the years to come. And so to that end, I want to show you guys one approach for integrating AI into mobile devices and bring amazing user experiences today. Over half of the Fortune 500 globally have disappeared, the companies kaput, gone, since 2000. And so how can we not have that situation, first of all, but also, what will happen to the other half, right? It's the companies who embrace AI. These uh, startups who are, well, nowadays, all the startups are saying, we are AI startup. Everyone is an AI startup. But a few short years ago, machine learning and AI was something that companies would add on to their product. They would say, oh, yeah, we do a little machine learning here on the side, right? But now every, everyone's doing it. It's, it's super uh, popular. And for the most part, people train on the server, right? Server has a lot of compute power, it makes sense. And I'm not going to refute that because it makes sense. And mobile is not a compute powerful platform. So we train on the server, that's fine. But what if we did the predictions on, the mobile, on mobile? What if we did inference there instead of serving them from a, server, a web server? And in particular, this approach can lead to amazing user experiences. I want to just show with uh, one illustration example. This is a uh, Google Translate. And it has the ability to overlay the translation directly in the image that you see. Now, you can tell just from the, the speed that it can do this that it is definitely not happening over the network, right? The video is not being streamed to Google servers and then sent back. That's why it works when you're offline. Uh, that wor it works on a boat. It works underwater. Well, if your phone can be underwater. It even probably would work in space. And having access to AI on your phone, wherever you go, that is responsive and accurate, that can really change things on a global scale for mobile, for the internet, and for computing. So how can we make something like that, right? Machine learning is hard enough by itself. Then put it on mobile. I mean, mobile apps aren't easy either. And so combining those, that can be a real challenge. So let me start by showing you guys what a little demo of what I've kind of put together. And then we'll talk through how we might build something like this. It's a simple demo, just mainly just to demonstrate the core kind of functionality. And what I've got here is a, uh, a phone, and I have a little app. If we switch over to the camera here, I have on the table a few uh, different candies. 
Let's see what we see here. Oh, great. And so let's see. Can you guys see this? OK. So what I'm going to do is we'll, we'll take some of these away. And if the lighting is good, you know, here we have a, a Reese's cup, right? And we can see here now that as the image kind of isolates down, it recognizes that. Now, I also have a smaller Reese's cup, which just fell on the floor. Okay, so we have a smaller Reese's cup here, and you know, and we, it will switch over and recognize that. Now you might say, well, how do I know that he's not cheating by sending all these images over the web, right? Well, let me. First of all, there's no no Wi-Fi here. <laughs> Secondly, let's let's just go ahead and and hit airplane mode, right? May as well, and and, and we'll see here that. You know, everything continues to work just fine. These are uh, some more peanut butter cups. I, I'm a big fan of peanut butter. And so let's push these guys away. And so here we have a shot of the Justin's, um, see here it says white chocolate uh, peanut butter cups. And you know, when my hand enters the frame, it may get upset. The candy is a little bit bent out of shape from its days inside the suitcase. But you know, you can see that it clearly recognizes that versus a very similar packaging Right, but this is milk chocolate. This is a milk chocolate peanut butter cup, and and this one also updates. You know, it updates right away. And you can see the the uh, confidence. And then we, here we have some juicy fruit gum just for variety. You know, some people don't like peanut butter. I understand that. So that's that's the gist of the demo here. And so if we switch back to the slides, we can think about how we might build something like this. How do we go from collecting data? to having an app that can recognize images in real time. Custom images, right? I, I just I chose these pretty arbitrarily. If you were to take any generic machine learning visual model and pointed them at this, it might say candy, candy bar. Maybe it even says chocolate. Maybe it just says yellow. <laughs> or, but how can you get something to recognize something that specific? You know, imagine having something recognize your particular products, your whether it's your brand, things in your home. And so this is my, our kind of um, guidelines here. This is what we'll, we'll follow. This is our little map. This is our roadmap. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to fill in each of these blocks and go from gathering data to having an application. So the first thing you've got to do is collect data. Right? Data collection is, as we all know, the most fun step of machine learning. Now, I've found a bit of a shortcut for you. Instead of uh, you know, collecting lots of pictures and then trimming them down and then labeling them, and it would just be a lot of work, right? It's just a lot of pictures. So maybe we can shoot some video. We shoot some video, and we only take the video of that particular object. So I go through each one, right? And you can see there I have one of the, the uh, peanut butter cups. And we go through each one, and we capture a video. And what's nice about that is that entire video, every single frame, is a picture of that object, hopefully from a different angle. So keep that camera moving. And then what we can do is we can, well, we chop that up. Right? There's a command line tool called FFmpeg, and there's lots of tools, ways you can chop up a video that's a solved problem. And we put those pictures all into one place, all together in one folder for each of the objects you want to recognize. So, so one folder for your juicy fruit, one folder for your milk chocolate peanut butter cups, one folder for the white chocolate ones, and so on. And so now we've if se effectively just labeled all of the images, right? We didn't have to come up with any sophisticated way to label it for us with some system. So that's great. So we have folders of images. What's next? Well, we take these pictures and we send them to training, right? So in, in my particular case, I uploaded them to the cloud because my MacBook was running out of space from all the images and pictures. And so I zipped them up, put them in the cloud, and I happened to do my training in the cloud. You can do them on your data center. You can do them on your local machine if you have a lot of storage. And the training we did is uh, using transfer learning. Now, the speaker before me mentioned transfer learning, so I won't go too much into detail about it, but I, I do have a kind of a little story, a little analogy that I recently accidentally discovered. I was playing with a puzzle. This is a jigsaw puzzle, right? Um, lots of pieces. And, and this is the final picture. This is the box 
showing what I was supposed to build. And I'm not a very good jigsaw puzzle person. I kind of struggle with it. But as I was struggling through this, I realized, you know, there's some good tricks in here I could do. First of all, I could separate the, the pieces with no images, the white pieces, from the, the everything else, right? So I moved all of the white pieces to one side. Okay, so that's the obvious step, first step. But then what? How do we start from there? I also noticed that in this image, the roofs, all the individual roofs are very uh, distinctly patterned. And so I said, ah, I know. I can look for pieces with this pattern. And with that, I can begin to put those together. Those were easy to find. I could recognize those patterns. So my brain's neural network, through my eyes, could find those individual small pieces and combine them together and say, ah, there's the roof. Similarly, I noticed in the stairs, the stairs have a distinct pattern. They're parallel lines. There's some of those X's there. And I could find the pieces that kind of looked similar and begin to squeeze those together and eventually get that together. And instantly, everything else came together. Well, there was a few more steps, right? But <laughs> that, that's as far as I got. The, the edge pieces, they're, they're so hard. Um, <laughs> So, so a convolutional neural network kind of works in a similar way. I use transfer learning with the inception model, which is a uh, model that the Google Brain team uh, created a few years ago. It has 48 layers. And to give you some perspective on how big or how small that might be, uh, just a few years ago, I think it was 2011 or 2012, it was impractical to train a neural network that was more than four layers deep. The year before Inception v3 came out, the model that won the international image recognition competition called ImageNet, that had 22 layers. So the Inception v3 model really was a giant leap ahead, right? more than double the number of layers. It really showcased the improvements in both computational uh, power that was available, as well as network design. So we can use that wonderful research and take it for our advantage. So we train the last layer right, of the network and leave everything else intact. This means that everything in the visual part of recognizing those pieces, recognizing the little bits, th the principal pieces are already there in place for us. So you have a great model. You can train it. But when you're done, you look at your file system and you say, wow, this model is 84 megabytes. I'm trying to put this in a mobile app. Can you help me out? Sure thing. We're going to optimize it for mobile. What can we do to shrink down a model? Well, handily enough, there is a graph transform tool. And what that's going to do for us, there's a couple of steps in there that we can do. The first thing is a technique called quantizing or quantization. And the floating point numbers, those 32-bit floating point numbers that are taking up all this space, we're going to shrink that down to just Eight bits. How can we get away with this? We're going to lose so much accuracy, right? Well, not necessarily. Luckily, neural networks are designed for fuzziness in their inputs. So by quantizing down to eight bits, and, and not just by rounding, but like actually saying these numbers are close enough, we're going to make them all kind of say this number and then this number. So within, say, the range, we're going to split that up into 256 pieces. So if the range of values is, say, negative 10 to 30, within there, we're going to divide it up into 256 little steps. And so that gives you a little more accuracy than just purely changing it directly to 8-bit. And additionally, that means when you do compression, those values are the same. And so that's what lets you go down literally uh, 4x. So you go from 84 megabytes down to around 20, 21 megabytes. And one small additional thing you can do is take away the parts of the graph, the parts of the graph that you don't need anymore for prediction. Right? There's some graph p nodes which are only useful for training. And there's also a tool that will prune that down for you as well. So that's also part of this graph transform tool. It's a whole suite of tools. So that's really useful. And I also want to call out that so far, everything we've done is l basically running existing code and existing tools. You didn't have to custom write anything. The only custom thing you had to do was shoot that video and run FFmpeg. So this really makes it 
in a, puts it in an immediate possibility type of stage. There is one more thing, one more consideration to think about when looking at deploying a machine learning model to a mobile device. And that is whether you package it inside the app or alongside the app. You can make it a data file or you can make it integrated into the app. And some of the thoughts there are whether you want to be able to secure the model, whether you want to be able to download updates without uh, pushing a new updated version of the app itself, and whether or not you care about sizing and how, whether or not you want to secure the, the model from outside access. So that's our, our overall design, right? We gather it up, we shoot up the videos, slice it up, and, and train and optimize, and then we can deploy it. So that, that's our, our finished model. And this is a video of the, the same thing, so I, I won't sh show that. And the final kind of point here is, how are we going to be able to, how have we done this, right? The, the, what makes this possible? And that's TensorFlow. TensorFlow is Google's machine learning library. Uh, hopefully, some of you have heard of it. Uh, it's too dark, so I can't do a show of hands. But it, it's been incredible to see the community adoption and the reception to the launch. Uh, it was open sourced in November of 2015 and hit 1.0 this past February. And with that, we have support for not just these platforms, right, which we expect, CPUs, GPUs, and of course, Android, but also iOS and Raspberry Pi. So for those of you who like to tinker with IoT devices, you can load a model onto a Raspberry Pi. So that means you can recognize things without any network traffic. It can be handy. And the community uh, response to TensorFlow in the past, well, now more than 14 months, but in the first 14 months, there were over 14,000 commits, hundreds of non-Google contributors. And now that it's 1.1, uh, 1.0, it is production ready. The APIs, APIs are stable and backwards compatible, so things won't change out from under you. So that's really quite nice. And so in conclusion, putting machine learning on mobile will just make that experience of mobile, the internet, and computing that much more powerful and usher in a new wave of innovation and open a whole new world of possibilities. And moreover, you can build one easily by gathering your own labeled data simply by shooting a video and running basically a series of well-defined steps and having a trained model as the output. So please, use this to build magical experiences for your users. And with that, I want to thank you and have some resources for you here. We have a code lab to help you do the inception retraining, and as well as a sample app for loading models into TensorFlow on GitHub. And so, thank you. <laughs>